Do you see God as having any role in the evolutionary process? For me, God is, is the power or the intelligence that shapes the whole of that process. Um, as creator, God's act is the beginning of all creation. So by setting up the laws of physics in the first place, in which context evolution takes place? Things unfold within that. What about intervening during the course of evolution? I find that that rather suggests that God couldn't have made a very good job of making the laws of yes. physics in the first place if he constantly needs to be adjusting the, uh, adjusting the system, adjusting the works. And I think that's a slightly different question. But there's a problem for the Church of England. Isn't it trying to have its cake and eat it too? But trying to have both God and the laws of science means that one or the other is compromised. Either God can't interfere and has no impact, or if he does get involved, it can't be squared with science. Um, you do believe in some of the New Testament miracles, I mean, such as the, the virgin birth and, and, and any, any others, I mean, the raising of Lazarus. Yes, and the raising of Lazarus, yes. Okay. Now, isn't there a kind of mismatch between your, your view of science as something that God doesn't interfere in and that um, somehow he made it right the, in the first place? How do you reconcile that with what looked to some of us like sort of more like cheap conjuring tricks and, and not the sort of grand um, creator that, 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 mm. that you've been portraying. I think if you start with a picture of you know, God outside messing around with the works, you are in danger of getting into the conjuring tricks model. I think, though, that um, there are certain moments when there is an opening in the world in which the underlying divine action comes through in a fresh way. Take the birth of Jesus. Here you have a long history of preparation for the coming of God in a new way. Here you have a particular life, that of Mary, opening itself up to the action of God in a certain way. And then something fresh happens, which is not, if you like, a suspension of the laws of nature, but nature itself opening up to its own depths. Something coming through now. I'm not sure what that means. I, that, it sounds to me awfully like suspension. <laughs> It's, poetic language, it's, it's I know. poetic yes. language. Um, and I realise that it, yeah. you know, there are ways of talking about that which do simply sound like God interrupting things. I mean, I, of course, love poetic language, but th mm. there does come a time when you worry that people are going to misunderstand it as... Or that it's a, a way of wriggling out of hard questions. <laughs> well, um, I mean, it, it's one thing to say, uh, in some poetic way, it was sort of right that Jesus should have been born of a virgin, mm. but when you say, I actually believe it mm. happened, that's a statement of fact. That's a statement of scientific fact. Mm. It, it, it happened. Yeah. Um, it's true or not, yes. It's true or not, and I don't think you can really wriggle out of that by doing some poetry, but uh, no, much no. as I love poetry. On the one hand, I've got a lot of sympathy with the decent, middle-of-the-road, moderate Christians. On the other hand, I sort of feel that the decent, middle-of-the-road Christians are tying themselves in knots, trying to have it both ways, trying to have both God and Darwin. And in a sense, they're opening the door, letting in the rabid creationists by making it respectable to believe things on the basis of faith rather than evidence. So, deny, attack, absorb. Now we've gone through the range of strategies by which religion tries to deal with Darwin. I think they all flounder. But even I can see why religion puts up this resistance. I get letters from readers who have understood the truth of evolution, but somehow wish they hadn't. Darwinism can be unsettling, even frightening. Darwin himself was shocked by what he called the low and horridly cruel behaviour he observed in nature, and yet it was integral to natural selection. One piece of research shook Darwin to his core. He knew how some insects, like this parasitic wasp, lay eggs in the larvae of other insects so that their young, when hatched, can feed on them. They also sting each part of the prey's nervous system so as to paralyze it, but not kill it, to keep the meat fresh. So the victim may be aware of being slowly eaten away from inside, but unable to move a muscle to do anything about it. How do we face this deeply disturbing truth, duck under a security blanket of faith in God? But then, Darwin wondered, what kind of god would create an animal that can only exist in this horrible way? Isn't it better to embrace reality 
bleak as it sometimes may be, than to avoid it and live a lie. In the teeth of life's hardships, Darwin was determined to live authentically. He hadn't just observed suffering as a scientist, he experienced it himself in his own life. Darwin had always had a particularly strong bond with his eldest daughter, Annie. He was charmed by her make-believe worlds and her neat little scrapbooks, while she liked to smooth his hair and pat his clothes into shape. But at just ten years old, she suffered a painful, lingering death following a bout of scarlet fever. Darwin was devastated. We have lost the joy of the household and the solace of our old age. His devout wife, Emma, told the other children that Annie had gone to heaven. For Emma, suffering helped to exalt our minds and to look forward with hope to a future state. Darwin, by contrast, could find no meaning or religious consolation as he faced the desperation of bereavement. After the initial period of mourning, he and Emma scarcely spoke of Annie, but they never forgot her. Religion became a source of tension between them. Finally, I think the tension had to spill out. In his 60s, Darwin wrote an autobiography in which he revealed his anger at what he called the manifestly false Bible story. And he added, I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished. And this is a damnable doctrine. Though his autobiography was written for his family, Darwin must have known it would be published after his death. And he grasped the opportunity to finally say in public what he had long struggled with in private. But if Darwinism demolishes the religious delusion, what can go in its place? How did Darwin himself find consolation in a godless universe? Religious people attack Darwin for, in their view, draining some of the wonder out of our world, for the bleakness of his vision of nature. The playwright George Bernard Shaw really hated Darwinism. He said, when its whole significance dawns on you, your heart sinks into a heap of sand within you. There is a hideous fatalism about it, a ghastly and damnable reduction of beauty and intelligence, of strength and purpose, of honor and aspiration. There's no doubt that people do find a Darwinian view of life bleak and unsympathetic, but it's still true and we can't get away from that. And further, in any case, there is a sort of happiness, there's a sort of bliss in understanding the elegance with which the world's put together. And Darwinian natural selection is a supremely elegant idea. It really does make everything fall into place and make sense. And I find great consolation, great happiness in that level of understanding. Just ponder for a moment Darwin's central idea, the tree of all life, now verified as fact by our decoded DNA. It means we are related to every living thing on the planet. And what's more, we are descended from ancestors who were winners, adapting in any way possible to survive and pass on their genes. You and I and every living creature can make the following proud claim. Not a single one of my ancestors died young. Not a single one of my ancestors failed to copulate. Plenty of other individuals died young and failed to copulate, but they didn't become ancestors. It's blindingly obvious, but from it much follows. It means that every single living creature has inherited the genes of an unbroken line of successful ancestors. We have all of us inherited what it takes to survive 